at this point in our service, we practice taking communion together. And for that purpose, please open your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 22. 2 Chronicles chapter 22. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we'd love to put one in your hand. Uh, if you don't have a Bible and you love to, to look at what we're, we're seeing this morning, there's a couple guys uh, happy to pass one out to you. Just raise your hand and they'll get one to you. God seems fond of stimulating faith in his people by making them wait on the fulfillment of his promises. This is typical of the way that God operates, and he often does this. He makes his people wait on the fulfillment of his promises in the midst of very bleak circumstances. We have such an instance here in 2 Chronicles chapter 22. Just look at verse 8. I hear pages still turning. It must mean we don't we don't go here often. <laughs> Second Chronicles twenty two eight says it came about when Jehu executed judgment on the house of Ahab. This was in fulfillment of a former prophecy. He found the princes of Judah and the sons of Ahaziah's brothers ministering to Ahaziah and slew them. This was further than he ought to have gone. Verse 9 says, He also sought Ahaziah, and they caught him while he was hiding in Samaria. They brought him to Jehu, put him to death, and buried him. For they said, He is the son of Jehoshaphat, who sought Yahweh with all his heart. So there was no one of the house of Ahaziah to retain the power of the kingdom. Now, when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she rose and destroyed all the royal offspring of the house of Judah. But Jehoshabeath, the king's daughter, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons who were being put to death and placed him and his nurse in the bedroom. So Jehoshabeath, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehuida, the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, sought him or hid him from Athaliah so that she would not put him to death. He was hidden with them in the house of God six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. Can you imagine a grandmother being so power hungry that she slaughters her grandchildren? That is what is happening in this passage. And... She does this once Jehu unlawfully removes those who might retain power in the kingdom in Judah. Then Athaliah goes even further and seeks to destroy all the royal offspring of the house of Judah. Now that's problematic for a number of reasons, just the, the horror of such a wicked act. But even beyond that, if you remember that God promised King David in 2 Samuel 7 that he would not lack a man to reign on his throne. King David is supposed to have descendants perpetually to reign on the throne so that eventually the Messiah comes from his line and reigns on the throne of David in Jerusalem. That's even still forthcoming. This poses a problem if all of the members of the royal offspring are killed, then God's promises are then nullified. They cannot come to fruition. 
And just notice that in the midst of this slaughter that's happening, all of the sons, the members of the royal line are being put to death. This aunt of this future king, Joash, takes him and hides him. But apparently no one knows this. So for six years, not six days, not six weeks, not six months, for six entire years, what is the nation left to think? The promises that God made to David, how do they get fulfilled? Can they come to fruition? When God's promises are so delayed that they seem to have failed, faith will sustain the faithful. Any faithful Jew, any faithful person who believed these promises would have said during this six-year period, I don't know how it's going to happen. There don't seem to be any descendants of David remaining. But I know that God cannot lie. God is true. God's promises will not fail. Maybe he has to resurrect someone, but his promises will not fail. That's what faithful disciples of Yahweh would have said during this six-year period. It was... In the seventh year, by the way, verse 1 of chapter 23, that the priest who had been hiding Joash strengthens himself. And finally, with the help of the royal guard and others in the nation, overthrow this tyrant, Athaliah, and appoint the rightful heir to the throne. And so in the seventh year, you have a seven-year-old made king over Israel, proving that God's promises have not failed. This was not the last time that God's promises seem to have failed. There was a three-day period after the king of Israel, who had revealed himself as such, Jesus of Nazareth, Proved by sign after sign after sign, miracle after miracle after miracle, that he was indeed the king who was coming. He was reversing the curse during his time on earth. Death, disease, disasters, demons, all were rendered powerless under the exercise of King Jesus' power. And then he died. And for three days, God's promises seemed to have failed. There was a delay of three days when the king was in the grave, and yet the faithful believed God's promises. Do you remember Jesus' rebuke to a couple of disciples on the road to Emmaus who despaired not believing those promises that were coming? Just listen. From Luke chapter 24, verse 25, Jesus said to them, this is before they realized that he is the resurrected Christ. He said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. When God's promises are so delayed that they seem to have failed, faith will sustain the faithful. And here, even today, we find ourselves in a similar position. Around the communion table, if you will, a promise outstanding of a crucified, resurrected Messiah who will come again to reign. God's promises have delayed for almost 2,000 years now. Communion 
is a bold proclamation that we believe God's promises will be fulfilled as he has spoken them. Because how long are we supposed to practice this? Until he comes. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So every time that we partake of the Lord's Supper, the faithful are declaring that that crucified Messiah who absorbed God's wrath in our place for sins that he did not commit, that we are responsible for committing, the one who endured God's wrath and rose again is also coming again for his people. This moment, when you take a cracker and juice, proclaiming that Jesus died in your place, the same one who rose again in your place, this is a bold proclamation that he is also coming and that God's promises have not failed. If you do not submit to King Jesus, if you do not believe the promises of God, that you are a sinner deserving of death, deserving of God's holy wrath against you, if you do not believe that Jesus died in the place of sinners, and if that faith is not demonstrated in a striving to obey him, then simply put, this is not for you. This isn't an attempt to shame you if that's you. But this is a time specifically for God's people to proclaim the Lord's death until his promise to come again is fulfilled. And so I want to encourage you, if you do not believe in Jesus, then you must. Today for you can be the day of salvation. When the bread and the juice come by, don't take the elements. Just let them pass. But do consider your standing before God. Consider what sin you're holding on to preventing you from submitting to King Jesus and repent of holding on to those sins. Submit to King Jesus and believe with the rest of us that this same king is coming to bring a kingdom where the wicked will be removed and only his faithful will be welcome to reign with him. Men, please come serve us, and I'll be back. Take communion on your own as your hearts are ready, and I'll come back and pray for us.